project my voice. Is anyone here hard of hearing? <laughs> Why not close? <laughs> interested in rock and chunks of uh, chalk which were easily carved and I remember as a boy in the stone quarries with the rest of the village kids chipping away and uh, making uh, unmentionable uh, <laughs> objects <laughs> which uh, allowed me to I became very sensitive to three dimensions uh, because of that early experience. It was a, a, a period when uh, things were happening around uh, and the boys that I were with, quite apart from playing cricket and uh, soccer, we were interested in war games because the people, our grown-up fathers and mothers, were the, uh, the leftovers from the First World War. And everything was kind of post-war in the... It was not unusual to see lots of people with one arm or one leg or missing body parts for here, there, and everything, which also had uh, an influence on me visually, which accounts for my uh, interest in anatomical uh, and psychological uh, bits that you might see or my sculptures even today, as if those kind of influences were played years and years ago. Uh, and then of course the other things were, uh, my father, although he was clumsy as all get out, he would leave his tools in the tool shed where he'd been mend mending his spade and his shovels that he used for his garden. And so I would sneak in there and produce airplanes made of wood, boats that would float in the village pond. And it was all very uh, competitive with the other village boys. Uh, and I, I developed a sense of 
the important, what, what interested me and still does more than anything else, the biggest impulse is my delight in the aesthetic uh, feeling for volume and, uh, and for tactility, but also just the objectness of things and the way things move. And being human, or at least slightly human, <laughs> uh, I'm interested in humans from the point of view of what they are doing and what is motivating them. But they're also, I mean, it's interesting in this, I was immediately uh, drawn to this space as I came in with these tables here. Now you're all sitting around as objects, all slightly different, different uh, attitudes, different body language, which is terribly interesting. And I'm, I, my next drawings that I will probably start this evening when I get home, you, it's going to be influenced by this <laughs> to a great degree. I'm always very aware of that kind of thing. Uh, as I say, my father was... Uh, was a cement works chemist. My mother wasn't. She, she was, she, she happened to be, fortunately, I think, the funniest person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> she could see the funny side of anything. And I hope I've uh, managed to, got a little of that in me too, because I can, never can take anything so seriously that at the end, turn up the leaf over and there is a spot of humor, of humor there. Life can be such a tragic mess up uh, and it's a revelation and it's a, it's a, it saved me so many, many times during my life to be able to, my mind just switches over to the funny side of something. Not sort of a cheap levity, but a deep-seated understanding that it's sort of, one can look at it and smile and thank God that it's a beautiful, beautiful joke. <laughs> and everything becomes uh, sensible again. I'm, my impressions in the village and when I was a kid was, uh, as I was saying, I remember my father's tool shed, my erector sets that I would get every Christmas, and I would make things. I would throw the instructions away <coughs> and build what I wanted to build with it. And that gave me a sense of construction. I could use my hands and the wonderful smell and the feel of the pieces, the coldness of the steel, the way the nuts worked on the bolts, the way you put things together. This was the greatest thrill. And I would spend hours constructing these things. And when my father came in with uh, minus one eye, uh, as I told you, and stumble over this stuff and curse and swear, <laughs> Uh, gave me the greatest pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember things that affected my aesthetic perception, like the big 17 miles away at Cardington was the big huge hangars which housed the big uh, dirigible balloons, the R100 and the R101. And when they took off, loaded with passengers to fly to France, they would come over the house and the village at about 500 feet. These enormous big sausages, silver, glinting in the sun with the gondolas underneath and the people hanging out of the windows, waving. <laughs> These enormous things in the sky coming over, blotting out the sky, practically. That's, that was a big impression on me. These big enormous things in the sky. And 
I'm still, uh, I, I still draw them when I draw them. Uh, the motor cars in a cutting through, it was an old Roman road, the Via Divana, uh, from London to the north of England, cut right through one section of the village, and it was called the cutting. It had been cut in many evil times, but deepened and uh, made ready for motor traffic when I was a kid. And we, I'd sit on the cliff overlooking the cutting, and as boys, and we'd see cars, three-wheeled Morris cars, and uh, huge big packets and things racing along this uh, in this big gorge. That was an also an aesthetic sculpture experience right there too. Bicycles and gliders. Near Dunstable, which is the, 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 the town near Houghton Ridge, is a mile and a half from Dunstable. On the downs, that is the escarpment overlooking uh, Dunstable, called Dunstable Downs. That is where the London Gliding Club kept their gliders. And before the war, before the Second World War, that is, now, you know, in the 30s, that is where, as boys, we'd go up there and actually thought we were helping, actually we were getting in the way of pulling the gliders up to the top of the hill so they could be released by rubber off. And Amy Johnson and all the early aviators would be doing this. And to see these people getting in front of the glider, and we, there we are, holding the tail at the back, with men, of course, and other, to stop it from moving until the rubber that was being pulled taut, and then the order to release. And this thing would scoot across the grass, and because the land is dropping away underneath it, would rise in the air, and it would go, and they'd be up for hours, circling high above. And then they come down and get the sky full of these wonderful contraptions made of bits of bamboo and light wood and canvas. I mean, that, that's enough to uh, get you wanting to draw right there. It gave me an attitude towards space and light and uh, distance and uh, how things moved and uh, the wonderful way that mankind has imitated birds in these, this primitive way to be able to do what the birds do. Uh, I, I've always wanted to do that, but I've never been, got around to it myself. And all, anything to do with aircraft fascinated me because of that, the way that uh, you run and leap and hope you can get airborne. <laughs> but with our limited anatomy, we have trouble. So you have to resort to intelligence to make a machine that you can sit in that will help you do it. And that's a wonderful thought right there. My influences in sculpture, you might not agree if you see this stuff now that I do, but one of my greatest influences was Jacob Epstein, hmm. the American sculptor that was born and raised in the Bronx, but came to England and London early on and settled and became a British citizen. Jacob Epstein is known in Europe tremendously. He's not known quite so much today. But in all the museums in, uh, in Europe, there is usually an Epstein, a wonderful carver, a magnificent modeler. His heads of famous people. 
you see in the National Gallery in, in, in England and other places, the Tate and everything, are extraordinary. But these carvings, I saw it at the Tate Gallery years ago, there was a retrospective, I think it was in 1980, no, 90s, no, I forget. Um, this huge marble, it was about 12 feet high, carved from a block, a huge block of uh, Carrara marble, a pregnant woman. And it was the most pregnant thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and it was white marble, unpolished, and roughly carved. But the enormity of this big mass of marble coming out from this head, which was back there, that was a, a, a terrific influence on me. Let's see, there was uh, Henry Moore, of course, but not so much. Henry Moore, I knew Mr. Moore. When I say I knew Mr. Moore, I went to see him two or three times. And we was invited to go back and see him on a couple of occasions. In fact, on my, my, my previous wife, not this one, another one. Uh, uh, we went to see him. Uh, uh, that was the last time I saw him. I think that was in 1961. And I took him some photographs of my work. I was working in metal in those days. And he wasn't terribly interested in what I was doing. I learned later that he didn't like anybody that welded metal. Well, that ruled me out right quick. <laughs> he was more interested in Alice than my wife. <laughs> Which was nice. He's a, he's a wonderful man. And uh, his, his ability to fill volume, nothing, I mean, he, he understood the classic better than anybody. He made me realize that if you want to experience volume, you have to put yourself in the middle of his work. And close your eyes and try and hit the surface from the inside all around and experience the, 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 the distances and the calibrate the, the tension of the surfaces in order to appreciate Henry Moore. It's not something you glance at. You just don't, you can't glance at that. You have to walk around it from all views. And you have to feel it, even if you have to feel it with your eyes, you have to learn it before you <laughs> in order to experience the great solidity and the mass of these things. That I learned from Henry Moore and from Epstein. Uh, then, of course, there was Eric Gill, who wasn't a volume man at all, but he was a type designer and a letter cutter and a carver, religiously oriented. And he's tradition. He was in the tradition of the the, uh, the arts and crafts movement in England in the last century, in the, in the 19th century, uh, William Morris, and going back to the values of the craft system as a reaction against industrialization. And <coughs> they, they wanted to get back to handcrafts and the beauty of individuality in the arts rather than the influx of the, in the mass production and things like that. Eric Gill was, and it's still alive in England. Well, I have a dear friend who, whose father was Eric Gill's uh, best assistant, or lifetime assistant, or Kevin Cribb. And he is still an uh, incised letter cutting of the finest quality you will find anywhere. And how he does it, I don't know. I've worked with him, I've seen him carve, and the delicacy of his touch 
is such you wouldn't believe the skill of his the way he manages to get the, the refinement in his work is uh, I mean I, I can't get anywhere close and I'm a pretty tidy guy <coughs> extraordinary so that was a big influence Mayol the French sculptor the feminine with women his wife was his model mostly you could tell it's the same woman she had thick ankles <coughs> <laughs> which appealed to the English because if you look at the queen, she has the tank. <laughs> and there's Archipanko, who worked in Paris. And uh, his abstractions of the human being, the Mac name is him, of a beauty. It's a small greenish kind of, it's a bronze uh, by Archipanko. Beautiful. Very, he was influenced, of course, by the Cubists. That understood, of course, Cubism really and truly was, although invented by painters, uh, one can say, was uh, only came to fruition when the sculptors uh, understood what they were trying to do. Picasso and uh, and uh, George Braque. I mean, they could understand, uh, they, they, I mean, rather, they didn't understand what they were doing quite. It was the sculptors that looked at their painting and thought, oh, oh <laughs> we can do that only correctly, not just the image of it, we can do it in fact. And that was a big revelation. So I've been through various periods of work in my life starting out mostly with stone and clay, and then plastic, messed around with plastic. But that's messy stuff. Chemically, you know, I, I mean, started to wheeze and cough using all kinds of plastics and capitalists and getting into that. But uh, I could see that, well, all right, I'm gonna be dead by the time I'm 50, I'm not gonna use it anymore. <laughs> so I quit that. Then I did some portraits, modeling. In fact, when I first came to this country in 1954 in Austin, I did a bronze head of the University of Texas, a, a, a portrait bust of J. Frank Dovey, the great uh, writer, folk at Loris. He became a friend of mine. Wonderful, wonderful man. And uh, he taught me a lot. He taught me about life. <coughs> he taught me about savoring the moment of J. Frank Dobie. I asked him one time, he was out on his little ranch that he'd got down on, uh, actually it was south of Barton Creek. And I drove out there one day and uh, I brought him a bottle of Jack Daniel bourbon. He kind of liked to sip a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> so, and there he was, he'd been out there for a fortnight on his little ranch, and he was sitting on the porch on a big old rocking chair, and I took him his bottle of Jack Daniel, and I said, don't you get lonely out here all by yourself? And he read back, and he said, no, Phil, he said, I know. He said, I, at my age, I like the workings of my own mind. And that statement has stuck with me ever since. And I've tried to be that way too. I, 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 I reflect on my own moments and judge myself. But did you enjoy this? Did you get anything out of it of any importance? Has it uplifted you? Well, the only thing that really uplifts me to the point of that it's an unworldly kind of feeling, a sensation, is the aesthetic thrill engendered by artistic creation. Of this, and I've never hated anything in art, really. I've disliked a lot of stuff. 
but it's always a wonderful thing to be able to do and to experience and to see and to savor. And in these days, unfortunately, it seems that people are more attitude towards, they, they, they are, they just glimpse at things. There is no, very little depth and quiet, long time savoring of a moment. Things happening too quickly. That's one reason I like being in Blancock County is because it gives me ample time. It's not uh, rare. I don't have to jump out of the way of, of uh, a lot of people that are driving crazy. I mean, I go out and what do I hear? I hear dogs barking and birds singing. And I can reflect. It, and, and that's, of course, uh, part of being an old man, too. A wheezing old fool. Fossilizing old <laughs> Gradually. By the way, the authorities in Blanco County allowed me parole to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> the other uh, the Egyptian sculpture, that is, a, that is a great influence as far as I'm concerned. Hmm. In Cambridge, there's a big uh, John Gayer Anderson bequest of Egyptian ancient Egyptian art. John Geyer Anderson was the, uh, I forget the guy's name that uh, first discovered, uh, who was it, Carter? He discovered Tutankhamun's tomb, the boy king. Anyway, he was with him. He's, he's, well, his collection of Egyptian stuff is in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. And I would haunt that place because of the, not anything as, uh, as grand as the British Museum collection, but it's a wonderful collection of high quality 